I mean, sometimes I wish that the, whoops, I'm not going to say it. Now. It's, it's being recorded, Dia. Yeah. Yep. Let me turn off my phone before I start because, you know, my first cousin three times removed is going to decide to call me. Mm, I think that's a good point. Okay. Uh, Pam, I, th I think we're all, all set to start if you want. Do you want to take it from here? Yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to take it from here. So let's see, let me share the screen first. All righty, well, welcome to tonight's presentation uh, for the Border Historical Society. And uh, we have a mission at the Border, Border Historical Society to uh, highlight Eastport and the both sides of the border uh, and to preserve uh, historic properties like the old barracks from Fort Sullivan that dates at least to the 1820s, uh, the old powder house at Fort Sullivan. And uh, we're, a, we're a growing group, a dynamic group. We have a lot of work to do and we are hoping you will join us uh, and membership is a whopping 10 Yankee dollars a year, uh, $20 for a family. Um, and we are a 501c3, so uh, you can write that off. And we, if you want to steer your contributions to the, B the, to the Border Historical Society, you can do that to the barracks or the powder house or the speakers or, you know, um, what you, whatever you want. And you can find us on Facebook, right? If you're here, you, pro you probably know about us on Facebook. There is a mosquito in this room. I apologize. <laughs> so... Uh, all right, so um, today we're going to be talking about the War of 1812 in East Fort Maine, and we're going to go over a few of the sites. We're not going to cover everything. Really, this talk today is going to be based on an old pamphlet uh, that is still available at the Quaddy Craft Shop, and uh, it can be mailed to you. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Wayne Wilcox, uh, who provided most of the research. Wayne is sort of an institution at Eastport. He is just an incredible researcher. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and Donna Thayer, who I don't know, who, who designed it, okay? So, uh, and I'd also like to thank Pam for doing all the hard work uh, in scanning this brochure and stuff, uh, which, which really helped me out because um, we're really talking about locations within Eastport. Um, but I've also reimagined that pamphlet a little bit. So we'll, we'll see if some technology works for me. Uh, you know, what are the chances? Uh, but uh, um, so uh, I think that sort of covers that. So I'm, I'm Josh Smith, by the way. It's delightful. It may be a boring name, but it's really easy to spell. Um, and I am a professor at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy in Kings Point, New York. And I am also the director of the American Merchant Marine Museum on the grounds of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. Uh, I uh, have some Maine roots. I'm really a Cape Codder, but I went to high school in Maine and I got my PhD at the University of Maine. Uh, and the first time I ever came to Eastport, I actually sailed there on the schooner Bowden when I was at Maine Maritime Academy. I, I immediately fell in love with the place. I think it's just a fascinating, fascinating part of the world. And that led to you know, a doctoral dissertation, which eventually got published as this blue book here called Borderland Smuggling. And uh, that should be available at the craft store uh, down by the waterfront in Eastport, or it's a, it's a paperback now and you can get it for about 20 bucks. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, it's not a bad little book. I, I see uh, uh, Charles is here. He, I think he, he just emailed me today and said, said he, he read it. So, uh, and he's still amongst the living. So it, it, it can't be too bad. It didn't, it didn't, didn't render any harm. Anyway. Um, Josh, I, Josh, I think, I think we've already sold out all of the copies that you sent. 
Oh, hey, Catherine. <laughs> yes, yes. That's, 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 that's six copies. That's that's pretty good. I'm pretty sure we did, yeah. Uh, one, we, one. Possibly one left, but I think I counted right. Yeah. So, yeah, they're, they're selling very well. Yep. Well, you know, the, the paperback version is so much cheaper and so much more affordable. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I, I also wrote a little paperback book uh, in cooperation with the University of New Brunswick in Canada from a Canadian perspective called Battle for the Bay, which is about the War of 1812 in the Bay of Fundy. Um, and it was really fun trying to write a book, you know, sort of pretending I was a Canadian. Uh, and that I, I, I don't think is available locally, but I see it for sale all over when I go over to St. Andrews. Uh, um, and uh, that sold very well too. That's that's a little more, you know, a little more naval history than the social history about Eastport. So, um, so I, I write a lot about this area, and Eastport plays a, a big role in my next book that's going to get published probably in 2022. Um, the press has managed to rename it already. They want to call it Making Maine Statehood in the War of 1812, and of course. A lot of the shenanigans in the War of 1812 in Maine do occur down east, uh, and I think that's that's going to be a, a, a great fun book too. So, um, all right, enough about me. Uh, so, the East, the, the Border Historical Society, turned out this great folded pamphlet. This is an, a, a great copy of it, um, and you can buy a copy, as I said before, and it's got a ton of information. It isn't just this map, there are pages of text. And uh, I think Wayne Wilcox probably produced most of that text. Does any, anybody know any different? That's what it says, so I'm going with it. All right, well, uh, too, too bad Wayne could, couldn't be with us. So uh, I think it's uh, a really good resource and I went over it pretty carefully uh, in preparation for this, we're not going to cover the whole thing or anything. I, I uh, you know, just like on Broadway, they say, oh, always leave them wanting more. That's sort of my take uh, with these history talks. Uh, I don't want to go over every detail, but I want to get you curious about it and researching some more on your own. So I've done some, something to this map, uh, which I'll show you in a second. Okay, I think we're at the end of the slides, so we're going to stop sharing. So what I did is I, I took information from that brochure and I incorporated it into an online app thing link. Um, so we're going from this, you know, very simple black and white brochure that's easy to produce to an electronic thing, which well, it certainly isn't in, in final format, but I think it'll help uh, uh, open our minds to the possibilities of using technology to present history in, in a more dynamic way. So let's share the screen and we'll see if my thing link actually works. Actually, I, I tested it before. It should not be a problem. Can everybody see a map? Give me a thumbs up if you see a map. Yes. So, oh, and it, these, these little icons do things. So this is Moose Island or Eastport. This is a map I created. The red dashed line uh, is the border, right? That, that runs in the harbor. Um, and these uh, icons all represent different things, uh, at different sites relevant to the War of 1812. And I, I hope this is big enough for everybody to, to make this stuff out. And we're going to go over these, but we're, we're also going to discuss the old brochure did have one problem. There was a whopper in there. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll talk about the whopper and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll fix that. So, um, okay, so we're going to start off with Fort Sullivan. Uh, and uh, hopefully everybody can see a square that appeared in the middle of the map. Is that true? nod your head if it did. Okay, so we can make that a little bit bigger. This is a, a British map of Fort Sullivan, which they renamed Fort Sherbrooke when, when they captured it in 
1814. It's probably a little too small for you all to see, but it shows the blockhouse and the officers quarters and even where some cannons were and stuff. So Fort Sullivan was built in 1808. Um, it was a stone battery, uh, which is to say gun position for these 18 pound cannons. These were cannons that fired an 18 pound ball. Um, it was designed by a local guy named Lemuel Trescott. Uh, let's see if I can pull up. Oh, what, what have I done here? There we go. Uh, so uh, Lemuel Trescott was sort of a big deal. Uh, he was a Revolutionary War veteran. He fought a lot down where I am here. I'm in Long Island, New York. And he was famous for capturing a Tory, uh, a Tory fortification or loyalist fortification um, called Fort Slongo, which is only about 10 miles from here. Uh, and he was very active. He knew George Washington. He was, he was a big deal. And he designed this fort in Eastport. He also designed the fort that is in Machiasport, which is known as Fort O'Brien. And um, he actually wasn't that great of an engineer. <laughs> it, uh, uh, the design wasn't very good for the guns. And, um, but it was all local labor. It was all lo local guys who built it. And it's built in response to concerns that there's going to be a war with Britain in 1808. There's a war scare that doesn't happen. Uh, but uh, American troops will occupy this fort in 1808. Um, but uh, why they're put there isn't so much to uh, fight the British as it is to um, prevent smuggling, um, which was really rampant in Eastport at that time. So. Um, it has a very small garrison. It's probably less than a dozen in 1812. And then more troops show up during the war. Um, and it, eventually uh, the British capture it without firing a shot uh, in, on July 11th, 1814, and they rename it Fort Sherbrooke. So let's see, let's look at some of these other little pictures, which you've probably seen before. Um, the Border Historical Society reproduced these in their, their great book, Border Fort. Uh, and I think we're going to have a talk by the author of that book soon. Um, you can see uh, the fort is up on the bluff, looking down over the harbor in this illustration. And to get a closer shot of that blockhouse, here you can see uh, the blockhouse and the battery. That's the, the stone rampart in, in front of it. Uh, and this gets torn down in what, the 1870s or something. Um, it, for those of you who are in Eastport, in the PV library, there is a really lovely oil painting of the blockhouse from below, looking from Water Street up at Fort Sullivan. And I, I just love that painting. If I could swing it, I'd, I'd love it to be on the cover of my next book, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. So Fort Sullivan is really an interesting part of Eastport because it's a whole other neighborhood that you can't really, you're not really supposed to go into. Uh, but as some people have pointed out, Eastport in the 1800s was kind of unique in Maine for being a garrison town, that it had this fort right in the heart of the community. You know, Portland had forts, but they were way out on the islands or out on points of land. Uh, but this, this is really smack dab in the center of town. The officers very often rented quarters in town. So it was really a part of the community. Uh, so that's Fort Sullivan. Um, let's see, where do we want to go next? So uh, part of Fort Sullivan, is the magazine. Uh, and that's this funny uh, brick structure next to the little wooden house. Um, and it's got tremendously thick walls. It's got, it has a, a brick interior. And I think there's a space between the two. This is, this is not actually a, a very unusual structure. It is sort of classic British military architecture. Uh, and this is where you put gunpowder. So 
this wasn't there until the British occupied the fort in 1814. Before that, there'd been a small magazine, uh, I think below the blockhouse where it was easy to get ammunition to the, to the cannons. Um, this magazine, by the way, uh, was covered in a wooden structure. Now the brochure says it was to disguise it as an ordinary storage shed. No, that's not, not really true. The, it's, it was really to protect it from the rain uh, because when you don't have that wooden structure, well, if you live in Eastport now and you go look at that magazine, there's not much of it left, right? Because the rain gets in and the frost and it just pops those stones apart. People walk off with the stones for whatever reasons. Uh, and now the Border Historical Society has put that nice fence around it to protect it. And I think that's you know some of the, the important work that the Border Historical Society does to protect this stuff. Uh, let's see, I think I may have another view of it. Oh yeah, and of course the Border Historical Society put up a nice broche, uh, you know, plaque uh, describing right and it's nice that it's still there because not all the plaques that go up stay there right we'll talk about that in a second okay so the fort um well i, I guess before we get to the, the british taking over the fort we have to get to what what the brochure called the first battle of eastport and i've got some really bad news for you um, so the brochure says that down on the south shore of uh, Moose Island, Eastport down here, that um, there was this battle between uh, soldiers from the, the fort, at, at Fort Sullivan, and the Royal Navy. Uh, unfortunately, that's not true. There was a battle, uh, but, oh, and I know you Eastport people are going to be upset. But the battle was actually in Lubeck, <laughs> um, and, and 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 I can show show you brochures about that. But some some of this is right if you can read this write up, which says April 30, 1814, Lieutenant Enoch Manning of the 40th U.S. Infantry and an armed guard of 12 soldiers were on the supply schooner from Boston to Fort Sullivan. The schooner was sighted by two British warships, HMS Brim and Phantom and chased uh, aground on a sand beach, not one in Eastport. Uh, and Lieutenant Manning and his men formed into battle line, and fired at the British boats repeatedly and drove them off. Uh, and, and he did successfully send to the fort for reinforcements. So this is largely correct, except for the location. Uh, the location almost certainly was mm, somewhere pretty much in Lubeck Village itself. It's right in uh, what are called the East Quadi Narrows. Uh, and the, that's pretty beachy around there, right? Uh, and I've got all sorts of references to that, uh, which I'll show you in a second. Now, what is true is Lieutenant Enoch Manning did form up his troops and really did admirable work in defending these two vessels that that uh, beach themselves to protect them from the British. What happened is um, the British were sort of blockading Eastport, and generally they had at least one warship in Passamaquoddy Bay uh, to keep an eye on Fort Sullivan. Uh, and on this night, uh, two of these ships were anchored in Friars Bay, right off Campobello, right within sight of Eastport. And HMS Phantom had sent out uh, a rowboat to patrol the East Quadi Narrows because little American boats would sneak through there and bring supplies to Fort Sullivan. Well, guess what? Uh, this boat, uh, sort of an early in the morning on May, uh, April 30th, saw these two schooners. The two schooners saw the British boat and recognized that, uh-oh, that they're going to want to capture us, and they beach themselves. Uh, and Manning sent away for help. The fort did send additional soldiers to help them out, and this this battle uh, did happen. Now let me show you some of the evidence, because 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 there will be people who are like, okay, Professor Smith, 
great, you said this, but what's your evidence? So let's look at another screen I have here. And let me make, crank up the size on that. Can people read that? So, so this is, I transcribed this from the logbook of the British schooner HMS Brim. Brim is spelled B-R-E-A-M, but like the fish, it's pronounced Brim. It's a, it's a really small warship, um, but a highly effective one, as it turns out. So, um, uh, you know, at, at six o'clock on the morning of the 30th, they get a, a, a flag signal from a larger warship, HMS Phantom, which was actually, it started out its life as a French privateer, had been captured by the Royal Navy and put into service as a British warship. And um, they realized that uh, these boats are, are having problems attacking these Americans on the shore in Lubeck. And uh, so the Brim, which is the smaller vessel, goes over there shallow draft, it can get closer and it can fire its cannons on the American soldiers. Uh, and what happens is the, the two small British boats, they're really rowboats, but armed and the guys have, have guns in them, uh, seem to be having trouble keeping station offshore because the current is starting to rip and it is starting to carry them through into the Bay of Fundy. So uh, they break off the fight. The Americans think they've killed like 20 British sailors. Um, turns out it's actually two, they wounded two, quite badly wounded two British sailors, but these accounts are always confusing. Uh, and when the, the two smaller boats get swept into the Bay of Fundy, then Brim follows them through the strait and, and goes and, and picks them up. And that actually goes over to mainland New, New, New Brunswick. Is that ha Harbor Latang? Latang? I'm, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that. Um, but where they, anyways. Uh, so here it is. We've got not only this logbook, I also have the logbook from the Phantom, which pretty much reinforces this. I could show you the American newspaper accounts, which are a little overblown, right? Um, but Enoch Manning, uh, Lieutenant. Manning did a fine job. He really did his duty. He was thought of uh, as a pretty good soldier um, by his peers, but perhaps not much of a gentleman. So he's a little rough around the edges. Uh, he was from New Hampshire originally, moved to Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, interestingly, uh, he escapes from the British, when the British invade Moose Island in July, 1814, he's actually in charge of a small barracks in Robinston. Um, and after the British capture Fort Sullivan in Eastport, uh, eventually they send troops over to, to capture the Robinston barracks. Well, Manning doesn't wait around for that. He, uh, he doesn't have many Supplies because he was getting his supplies from Fort Sullivan. So he decides to head out for Machias to Fort O'Brien. And he actually hires uh, a, a Passamaquoddy, an Indian, Native American, First Nations, however you want to say that, as a guide. And they walk through the woods to Machias Fort. And we have the letters from one of one of the, uh, I think a corporal or a sergeant who was part of that group, and it, it's kind of humorous because he says that group did nothing but bicker and argue the whole way on their walk from Robinson to Machias. They were just very unhappy campers. They won't really be much happier when they get to Machias because they're going to get chased out of there too. So, all right, let's stop sharing that. Uh, and let's go back to Thingland. Okay, um, by the way, the, the graphic here is the deck plan 
of the schooner HMS Brim. Actually, it's a it's a deck plan of one of its sister ships. Um, but these are schooners. They're they're not made in England, by the way. They are made in Bermuda, uh, and most of them managed to sink themselves. They were terrible boats. They 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 just not 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 good ships. But uh, Brim was probably the most successful. And after the war, it actually gets returned to Bermuda, where it's it's broken up. It's just an old, tired boat by that time. But it's it's really very, very small. Okay. So the, the fall of Eastport, or Moose Island, if you're Canadian or British, um, is because the, the British send a big fleet uh, to capture Eastport. And the fleet actually comes from where? Well, actually, it comes from Bermuda. Uh, and it meets up with a smaller force coming out of Halifax. And um, when the British attack Eastport, um, their idea is they are not attacking Eastport. They are retaking possession of Moose Island. They never recognize that. Moose Island or Eastport was part of then you know, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. They thought it had been illegally occupied by the Americans. So the British decide, with some prompting from our friends in New Brunswick, I might add, no thank you, Fredericton, um, that, that uh, 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 the, the folks in New Brunswick up in, up in Fredericton are like, well, you know, hey, we're at war. Maybe it's time to resolve this border issue. And we kind of like to see Moose Island as part of New Brunswick. And um, the British were already aware of that in London and, and uh, everything sort of coordinated. And this fleet includes a 74 gun ship, a, a mammoth warship, bigger than anything in the American Navy. There are several other warships, including ships called bomb ships that are specially designed to reduce coastal fortifications. There are, I think, two regiments of soldiers. There are engineers and other staff officers who can do these things. And commanding the naval component is a guy who's very famous. Oops, there he is. Sir Thomas Masterman Hardy. Uh, Sir Thomas was a very famous British naval officer. Uh, in part because at uh, the Battle of Trafalgar, he had commanded the, the uh, mammoth ship, the uh, uh, HMS Victory, which is still around. You can see it in England. Uh, and that was the flagship for the British fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar. And the commanding admiral was on that ship. And the commanding admiral was a, a short little guy with an eye patch and only one arm, a, a fellow named Horatio Nelson, the most famous British naval officer bar none. And he was a short guy, but it, he, was, he was a fierce fighter. That's how he lost his eye and he lost his arm. And he insisted in going into battle in full uniform. Uh, and Horatio Nelson was gunned down by a French marksman uh, on, on board his, his flagship. He fell on his own quarterdeck. Uh, and his last words uh, were to Sir Thomas Masterman Hardy, the, the fellow pictured here. Uh, and there are two versions. The words were either uh, kismet Hardy, which means sort of hard luck, eh? Uh, or it was kiss me Hardy, which is, um, you know, you know, just an expression of fondness that he were he and uh, Hardy were like brothers. Anyways, um, Hardy is a really big deal in, in British history and uh, uh, a tough customer. Uh, and basically, the British fleet sails into the harbor. You know, the Americans run to their cannons, but you know it's a big British fleet, and you know the cannons come out on the British fleet and. Uh, an officer comes up to Fort Sullivan and, and demands surrender. And the commander of the fort is a guy named Curly Putnam from Massachusetts. He'd really been a, a contractor before the war, 
a house carpenter, if you will. Uh, he's really totally unprepared for this war. Here he is facing these huge warships. He's got 60 guys and four cannons compared to over 100 with the British. And of course, the townsfolk show up and they say, well, we don't want to fight because if there's a fight, they're going to level the town. Uh, so the selectmen essentially are begging uh, Putnam not to fire back. And uh, he, in fact, does decide to surrender without a fight, uh, which is probably the right decision. Now, I think that the interesting thing that happens at that moment is four enlisted soldiers see the way this is going down. They don't like it. Uh, and they bolt. They run away. Uh, although they're supposed to stay in the fort and surrender with everybody else, they run away and they too run to Fort O'Brien uh, in Machias. Uh, and then they eventually walk all the way to Castine and then all the way to Portland with, with uh, very, very little in the way of food or anything. Those guys were probably smart. Uh, because while the American officers are immediately released, this is called parole. On their honor, they swear as officers that they're not going to fight uh, basically for the rest of the war until they're formally exchanged, it's called. Uh, but the uh, American garrison, the, the soldiers, the privates, the sergeants, and everybody else, they go on to British warships and they go to... Uh, Halifax, uh, and they stay in prison there for the rest of the war. Uh, and at least one of them dies in Halifax. Others get sick and never, never really recover. Uh, one of these fellows is returned after the war, and he, he, you know, he got home, and four days later he died. Um, so this is really a very bad experience for the enlisted personnel. So hurrah for those four guys who ran away. They, they had it right. Um, okay. Let's see what else. I don't know if I have another picture here. Oh, that's just a, a plan of uh, uh, HMS Ramillies, which was uh, Hardy's flagship at this time. Uh, and I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. So... The British now hold Eastport, which they refuse to call Eastport. So then it's always Moose Island because Eastport was the name that Massachusetts incorporated it under and they regard that as illegitimate. So what do the British do? Well, of course they, uh, they are nervous that the Americans will try to take it back. So they erect additional fortifications. Now, let's see if I get this right. right. Uh, and I think the, these fortifications are over by, some of them are over by, I think is what is your elementary school? Let's see what happens if I click this. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, amongst other things, they erect another blockhouse. It didn't look like this at the time. It had a flat roof, you know, so guys could fire guns off the roof. Um, and, uh, this survives the war and has sort of an interesting history after the war. But obviously it, it never sees combat because the Americans never do try to take Eastport back. But this is one of the barracks for the British enlisted personnel uh, who also live in a warehouse in town and of course in Fort Sullivan. And the officers tend to get sprinkled around in the nicer, town, the nicer houses in town. So um, after the war, this becomes, uh, uh, somebody buys it, uh, and it, uh, they put a flat, uh, they put a pitched roof on it to shed the snow and the rain, and it becomes a tavern called the Bell Tavern, and quite a notorious place, uh, you know, noted for gambling, drinking, fighting, prostitution, and was said to be haunted by the ghost of Private Shea. Um, so Private Shea was a poor British soldier who probably wasn't very well balanced in the head. Uh, and he uh, attacked, attempted to rape and, and killed uh, a serving girl who was uh, uh, worked for one of the British officers. I think actually worked for the British chaplain. And 
Uh, he was captured almost immediately. Uh, he was thrown uh, into a cell. He was chained at the neck and at the legs so he couldn't escape. Um, I've got extensive documents on this, but somehow uh, he managed to uh, break his chains one day and, and he managed to rip the rope handle off a bucket and he used that rope um, to hang himself. Uh, a really tragic, right? I mean, it's just awful when people commit suicide. Um, and uh, so he said to haunt this place, um, Shay's body, and Wayne, I wish Wayne Wilcox were here because he could tell me. Um, my understanding is that, is that Shay's body is not buried in a proper cemetery, but that it's so, sort of buried in a mud flat or just thrown out in a, in a coffin out in the bay. Certainly the, the British did that to deserters uh, in places like uh, Machias and, and, and uh, stuff. So um, his body was not respected. It was not deemed worthy of being in a formal graveyard is my understanding. Again, ask Wayne next time you see him. I'm sure he'd be glad to talk about it. Uh, near that blockhouse, See if we can. I'm sorry that this isn't bigger, but this is a British map, and I sh I showed you the 1808 version of this map last time I spoke. This is the same map, but they copied everything in it in 1814, and then they drew over it some of the additional fortifications. And uh, over here, oh, you can't see my mouse. Um, uh, it, you can see in the references, uh, reference C, battery for four 12 pounders. So there were four 12 pound can, cannon in a battery, an earthwork uh, over by uh, that uh, blockhouse. And then further north, where the letter A is on the map, was a, a, a redoubt uh, with guns and maybe another blockhouse. I'm not sure the other blockhouse got made or not. And I think that's, oh, wasn't that where all the mucky mucks had their houses built when they were doing the Passamaquoddy Dam project, I think. But, you know, speak up if anybody knows better because you're the locals. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so, all right. So there, there are various batteries built around town. Actually, there's one not, apparently not so far from Ruth's uh, house there. So uh, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things going on. And I think that's the only picture I have uh, for that. So uh, while the British are here, there, there are a couple things that go on. Um, and one of those things is that just naturally, some of the British garrison died. And over here, uh, and, and initially they're buried here by the water in an old cemetery. And Wayne has that uh, on Water Street in the field above and leading down to Little's Cove. And I, I only have a vague idea of, of what that means. Um, but he says, uh, you know, there were eight British soldiers and one sailor buried uh, in this area, which is called, known locally as the English Burying Ground or English Corner, which is qu quite an interesting name. Um, but uh, there was severe erosion. They were buried right near the shore on the bluff ab above the shore. Uh, and so the graves who they knew were there got moved to Hillside Cemetery uh, at some point. I, I don't know when. Again, Wayne Wilcox may be the guy to ask. Um, and there are two officers there because they're officers, their graves were marked, and we're going to talk about them in a second. And their names were Lieutenant or Lieutenant, I should say, they're British, Lieutenant uh, Walter St. John. St. John sometimes in England gets pronounced Sinjin. I'm, I'm not sure if he was one of those. And Lieutenant Thomas Raymond. Uh, and their graves were relocated, and they have stones, which I'll show you in a second. Um, graves of the enlisted men, well, you know, they weren't really marked. There were no identifying stones. Maybe they had a wooden marker that rotted away. So if you stumble across a bone down there, 
Yeah. Uh, who knows what it was? Uh, okay, so from the waterfront up to Hillside Cemetery, here are the stones a few years ago. And again, I want to thank Cam for getting all these nice images for me. And I think it was 2014, right, Pam, when, when these were installed? The, 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 yes. So the, the plaques were, were added and um, a, a bunch of Canadian veterans came down and they did just a, a really nice ceremony. Now, the, the sad thing is, we'll go to the next picture of gravestone, um, is that you can see that uh, it's St. John's uh, uh, grave. The, the stone is still there, but somebody stole the plaque, which is, um, I'm sorry, that's just contemptible. Uh, you know, it, it can't have been worth any real money. Why would you steal? Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somebody just thought it was loose and it need to be protected. But um, the fact of the matter is, it ain't there, um, and that's not right. Uh, I think that's just uh, awful that people would would do that. Um, the uh, Lieutenant Raymond's stone is interesting because he was a Freemason, uh, as were many British officers, and you can see the the Freemason symbols on is stone um, and uh, probably the local Freemasons and there were local Freemasons, we, we know that, um, probably got involved in, in his funeral or perhaps moving uh, his, his stone. Um, that's a little bit uh, out of my field. So let's see, what else do we have here? Okay. Um, oh, so, um, there, the experience of military occupation in Eastport wasn't always very comfortable. And uh, this one fellow, Bowker, um, was caught. It's the, the, the sources say he was from Lubeck, but Bowker is sort of a Machias name in, in my experience. Um, but uh, he was trying to help some British soldiers desert. There was a lot of British soldiers who deserted from Eastport, uh, and he was made an example of, uh, and they uh, walked him through the streets, tied to the back of an ox cart, apparently. I haven't found the, the, the sources for this yet, uh, but it seems entirely likely. I certainly have heard about Bowker getting flogged from other sources, and uh, he's given uh, a lot of lashes, 200 lashes. Now, here it says he died later that night from his wounds. I don't think my sources say that, I, I, but I'd have to do more research. You know, sometimes when you, you know, people embellish on stories, right? I'm sure we're all familiar with that. And mm, I, I think there would have been more outcry at the time if that had been the case. But I don't know. It's, it's really worth investigating. And, I want to borrow down on and, and find out. So uh, Pam actually found some great images for uh, this presentation. Uh, and this is a whipping triangle. Um, and apparently the British whipped their soldiers at the bottom of Boynton Street, uh, down by the waterfront. Um, and mind you, it, it wasn't just the British who flogged their soldiers. The, the American army flogged soldiers until 1812. Uh, and there were American soldiers flogged at Fort Sullivan in 1808 and 1809. And boy, Eastport people were not happy about that. They did not like to see American boys getting whipped like that. And they wrote to Washington and complained about it. Um, and I don't think they enjoyed watching British soldiers get flogged either. And they certainly were deeply upset that, um, you know, that locals were getting flogged. Uh, I, I think it really made them very, very angry. Uh, this is a pretty fancy whipping triangle. I, Pam, where, where did you find this photo? Do you remember? I think it's in Fredericton. Is it? 
Well, it's a fancy one. Yet you, usually they, they weren't that elaborate. Um, but uh, wow, if Bob Dallison were here, he, he could probably tell us. Um, so, you know, you, you get lashed to this thing uh, and, you know, your back just gets ripped open um, by a cat of nine tails, which, which is usually leather and it usually has knots put into it. And those knots are there really to inflict maximum damage, to really flay open the skin uh, and to make it painful. It's physically painful, but I think even worse than the physical pain is it's deeply humiliating uh, that men who get flogged are often embittered for life and they literally carry the scars throughout their life. Let's see, I think I have, oops, I thought I had another picture uh, that I found of, of, uh, of flogging, but uh, apparently not. So um, grim, grim stuff. Military occupation is no joke. So let's see. Um, now I want to talk about, about a, a couple of the, the houses in Eastport. I'm just going to touch on them briefly. And if anybody knows anything, you know, let me know. It doesn't have to be me doing all the talking by, by any stretch. So that's, uh, uh, as I was saying before, oh, I misspelled Oliver there. Um, the British officers get sprinkled throughout town in, in, in the nicer houses. Uh, this is the Oliver Shed house. Uh, Shed was the local militia colonel. And him, a lot of people must have liked him because I think that's who the high school's named after, right? Uh, but um, as a militia officer, Shed was less than stellar. At the beginning of the War of 1812, he called out the local militia to defend Eastport. There, there's there's a panic. A lot of the women and children left Eastport. It's just the men. And there's, there's thought that the British will immediately attack Eastport, which doesn't happen. Uh, but uh, so a lot of the men are out. But uh, Shed is sort of a sloppy commander. Uh, and he isn't very good at organizing them. And, uh, you know, after a couple of weeks, uh, and he wears this uniform and epaulets and a big sword and all. And eventually the, the little boys in town are chasing him around and, and calling him names and stuff. It must have been sort of humiliating, but, but you can see how that could happen with somebody who wasn't perhaps really comfortable uh, in that role. Uh, but uh, two-story house was a big deal in Eastport in 1812. Uh, I'm going to have to look more, more carefully at that house. It's obviously been uh, uh, changed quite a bit since 1812. Other homes include uh, the Samuel Wheeler house, that immense house, right? Uh, and uh, I don't know, who, who took these pictures for you, Pam? They're really recent. Kathy did. Yeah, hey, thank you, Kathy. Um, that, nice work. Uh, so I don't know much about Wheeler other than that he's a merchant. Yet, Yes, he is one of those smuggling merchants from Eastport. Uh, but uh, a, a big deal locally. Let's see. Uh, the Jonathan Weston House, J.D. Weston, was Eastport's first lawyer. Um, and his house shows it. It's a big house. Uh, he's also one of the very few guys in town who vote Federalist. Um, uh, Eastport was very much a, a Jeffersonian or Republican town uh, and voted almost entirely Republican, usually. Uh, but there were two notable Federalists in town. One was the lawyer. Lawyers were almost always Federalists, J.D. Weston. Uh, and the other is the foremost smuggler in town, uh, a guy named Jabez Maori, uh, and or Maury. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Uh, we're the only really well-known Federalists in town. And uh, the, uh, this house is especially interesting to me because it, it was the home of the area's first federal customs collector. This is the guy who treats smugglers uh, before the War of 1812, a, a guy named Louis F. 
uh, I, I think he's re usually referred to locally as Dernier or Le Dernier, but um, he's actually Swiss. Uh, his, his, I, I think he was born in Nova Scotia, but his father was from Switzerland. Uh, and his, his father came and moved to Maine during the American Revolution um, because he wanted Nova Scotia to be part of the revolution. And oops, that, that didn't work out so well. Uh, but apparently uh, British Quarters, which I didn't know, by this time he had been replaced as the customs collector. But this house is especially important to me because in 1808, when Ladernier is trying very hard to stop smugglers in Eastport, which is not easy, um, the smugglers threaten to burn this house down, which is playing hardball, right? <laughs> that's, that's pretty scary when the people are threatening to assault your home. Okay, and just one more spot on this. Um, so the British stay in Eastport until 1818 when there is a, a, an international negotiation uh, and this international arbitration finds that Moose Island is in fact American territory uh, and on July 1st, 1818, it gets returned to the United States and to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I might add as well, uh, and there's a big party. And oops, I guess I didn't capture the uh, the image of the Kilby House, but you all know what the Kilby House looks like. It's 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 beautiful, right? Uh, and that's sort of my little tour of Eastport, where I I took this really cool pamphlet and turned it into something electronic. Um, so we're at six fifty two. Uh, I don't want to exceed an hour for sure, but. Uh, Boy, who's got comments or questions or let's talk. I think we're ready for QR codes. Yeah, uh, that, I think that's a, a real possibility. You, you could put those up and we could have a website. It's, it's not so hard to do, uh, but it does, you know, it, it takes websites, mo mostly time and talent, not so much money. But I think that's the way to go. So people could go around Eastport with their phones and get this information. I think, you know, brochures had their day, um, but that's kind, kind of done because nobody wants to walk around with that extra piece of paper anymore. If it's on the phone and better yet, if that electronic tour of Eastport and there's lots more to put on it, right? Not just this 1812 stuff. If it has a uh, audio component, Right, so people can listen to it. Oh, that that would be really neat, and I think that would help draw people to Eastport. It would help out the craft shop and and all the other retail folks, and uh, you know, get get the town the attention it deserves. Right on. Yeah, it's a neat place. I love going to Eastport, and uh, you know, I, I love going down to uh, C Street and having a, what is it, salmon taco or, you know, <laughs> there's, there's good food up there too. So, uh, so uh, anybody else got anything to say or something to share or any comments? Well, um, if you do have comments, and I know some of you have emailed me, like, like Charles Rath there, who was what, Charles, you're out in California, right? Um, yes, indeed. Oops. There, there you go. So um, write me an email. My uh, email at the Arch Marine Academy is smithj at usmma.edu or get in touch through the Facebook site for the Border Historical Society. And I hope you're all members of the Border Historical Society. Again, it's 10 Yankee dollars and, and you're in for a year. It, it, it is a bargain. So um, if nobody has anything to say, Pam, do, do you have anything to say? No, I thought this, this has been terrific. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, it, it's my pleasure. And I want to give a special shout out to your mother, Ruth. Ruth, I, I hope you're feeling better soon. I understand you're, you're a little under the weather. And uh, get well soon. I, I need to come up there and see you sometime. 
Uh, if I might share my screen, I'll show you a picture of those two graves you had the day that they were dedicated. Oh, in 2014. Great. Is that on there? Oh, beautiful. Very nice photo. Right. I'll send this to you after we're done, Pam. Yeah. It, it, and it's it, such a it so disheartening when Kathy went to take an update and saw that that left plaque was missing. Just, just appalling. Yeah. Just appalling. So great photo. It needs to be on Facebook. So I don't know how to get out of share screen now. <laughs> uh, the same way you went in, there should be a green button at the bottom that says share screen. Hit that again. And I think that will oh, stop share. OK. Yeah. Yeah, and this is this is the British re-entering Eastport Harbor to catch her, to capture Moose Island. Ah, uh, yeah, there you go, on the schooner. That goes back seven years. Yep. Yeah, I'll send you that one too. <laughs> Thank uh, you very much. And if anyone else has photos of either the commemoration in 2014 or 2018, we'd love to have them. I have some, but they're mostly of my daughter. It was just a little girl then, and now she's all grown up. <laughs> yeah. In the background, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad we had our Canadian friends here, folks from St. Andrews uh, came by. Uh, and uh, uh, I see some people have some, some questions. Uh, my connection with the Merchant Marine, I went to Maine Maritime Academy uh, and got a small license and sailed on the schooner Bowden and worked on ferry boats and small cruise ships down in the Caribbean and in the Pacific. So uh, sailed to Greenland on the boat, so, which comes by Eastport every once in a while. Josh, would you repeat your email address, please? Sure. smithj at usmma.edu. I'll put it in chat so you can capture that. So uh, you want to cut and paste it real quick <laughs> before we end, because then it's gone, right? And Josh, you wrote another book I really liked about Fort Edgecombe. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I wrote a, Fort about, a, a book about Fort Edgecombe. I don't know what it is with me in the War of 1812, but you know, I probably got dropped on my head as a child. Josh, it didn't appear in the chat. Uh, I, I goofed. Um, uh, the, the, I think the Edgecombe Historical Society has about 500 copies in their basement. <laughs> we should get some of them up here. And can you get us some more to the craft shop of your other fundy, you know, past McCarty books? Uh, sure. I, I, I probably can't, can't just give them to you like I did with the last one, but I, you know, uh, there must be a way to, to purchase them at uh, wholesale cost. And okay, are they at Goose Lane or? Uh, Goose Lane is for the Battle for the Bay book, uh, and then University Press of Florida for the Borderland Smuggling book. Okay. Well, thank you very much for doing this presentation. And if everybody knows that we will be talking about Fort Sullivan again for our September presentation, which will feature David Zimmerman, who wrote the book Coastal Fort about Fort Sullivan in 1984. So hope to see you all again. Thank you for coming tonight. Applause for Josh. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, that was great. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.